So good morning again, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. We are continuing our series explaining world events. I think we live in a time where people are asking questions, and it's not the first I'm going to see what I've said, what I'm going to see now. I was coming back from a conference in Pittsburgh, and I was in the last seat on the plane, and way to the back, to the right. And I got in a discussion with that gentleman about world events. People are asking questions. It's apparent that something is about to happen. People are not quite sure what is going to happen, but they know things are just not normal. And he was asking questions. And that prompted me to, as I said before, share with you what I've been studying for at least the last 10 years that I've written, 10 years back. The Lord has brought more light, and I said, now is the time to share it. The Lord impressed my mind, said so that's the case. So we're going to look at explaining world events. Viewed in the context of history and Bible prophecy. Here is what's interesting. People out there asking questions, but guess what? They're asking the question with their bare eyes. When you place on the prophetic lens, the questions come in focus and the answers are, answers are apparent. Are you following me? Yes. So we're not going to be like the world just asking questions. We're going to be using the prophetic eye. So we're going to view in the context of history and Bible prophecy. Now this has been, I guess you could say, our main quotation we have been using from the book Education 179, the fifth paragraph. It says, The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist amongst the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Thinking men, thinking women, rulers, legislators, they are indeed asking questions. And I've said it before, I'm going to say it again because I'm not saying it boastful. I'm saying it because it reflects the responsibility we have as Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church that can answer the issues of world events. Yes. That's not a boast, friends. It's just a fact. So we have a responsibility. It goes on, Review and Herald, November 8, 1881 says what? The prosperity of a nation is dependent upon the virtue and intelligence of its citizens. To secure these blessings, habits of strict temperance are indispensable. The history of ancient kingdoms is replete with lessons of warning for us. The first four studies in this series was looking on the relationship between ancient Rome and the United States of America. And the second lecture I asked the question, are we Rome? And the answer was what? Yes. I beg of you, go back. Go to YouTube, type in USA in Prophecy, type in my name, Robert Parks, P-A-R-K-E-S. Watch the first four, and this slide explodes in meaning. It goes on to say, It remains to be seen whether our own republic will be admonished by the example and avoid your fate. We shall not avoid your fate. We are running the course and the path of the Roman Republic. And the first four lectures in the series brought that out in great clarity. The summary of the first four lectures is this. This is a super summary. Fall of the Roman Empire and its absorption into ten kingdoms, then the rise of the papacy to absolute power. So here we saw that the Roman Empire, or it was, the Roman Empire fell and was absorbed into what? Ten kingdoms. And from those ten kingdoms rose what? The papacy to absolute power. Friends, I beg of you, go back and look at the first four sermons. USA in Prophecy, Robert Parks, P-R-K-E-S. Type that into YouTube, it will come up. Watch the first four sermons. I spent the time by God's grace to explain that. But we learned something else in the process. That a similar parallel runs when we look at United States of America in Prophecy. The fall of the U.S. Empire and its absorption of the Ten Kingdoms, then the rise of the papacy to absolute world power. This is the United States Empire. We discussed that. It's a military empire. Yes, 
Go back and look at the study. It's there. We'll get out in great detail. The U.S. will fall and will be absorbed as a part of the ten horns that's seen in Revelation chapter 17 and that beast with seven and ten horns. Go back and look at that study again. And from the fall of the U.S. and its absorption, these ten kings, we are in the process, even very now, of the uprising of a new world order. And this world order is depicted in Revelation chapter 17 in a beast with seven head and ten horns being ridden by a woman in purple and scarlet. Again, we studied that too in the first four lectures. Go back and look at that. I would learn that this is a religious war. War is a strong word, but that's what the word of God says. That's not my word. Go back to the book, the Bible. It says that. It describes it as a war. This is a church system Specifically, the Roman Catholic Church system. We're not calling Roman Catholics wars. Let me be clear on that. God has his people in all churches. And we love everyone. We're talking about the system. Amen, church? Amen. Let's make a distinction now, because we love people. We don't want to offend people. That's not the intent. It's the Roman Catholic Church system. And even within that system, there are very good people who love the Lord and are walking the best life that they have. And God is going to bring them more light. I'm pretty sure of that. And that woman sits on a beast. A political beast. And that political beast is the ten kingdoms that the club of Rome in 1973 has divided the world up into. And by the way, those regions are already in the making. Yeah. Now, so this is what we're talking about. The New World Order. It's a Biblically sound. Bible describes it. Political beast with seven and ten horns. And a religious who are riding the beast. So a church in charge of the what? World state. Revelation chapter 17. Go back and look at the first four studies. USA in prophecy. Robert Parks. P-A-R-K-E-S. We have discussed this in great detail. Now we're going to take flight now. Here's where we're going to take flight. We have discussed a new world order with a church, the Roman Catholic Church system, in charge of this tenfold, ten kingdoms of the world being divided. But what's the law that's going to govern this new world order? That's where we're going to spend our time on doing this morning. What's the law that we'll have to face and we're facing now? And we'll face in this system that's been set up right now. Let's go and see what the Word of God says and see what we're in tune for. So we're entitled Wickedness in the Ephah. Topic this morning is Wickedness in the Ephah. We'll start, we'll start with Zechariah 4. So Zechariah 4 and Zechariah 5. Zechariah 4 and Zechariah 5 is our topics. My friend, don't worry. I'll make, we'll accommodate everybody. All right? So if I, I'm, gonna, I'm watching everybody's face and everybody's body language. Sometimes I'm going to speed up, sometimes I'm going to slow down. Don't worry. We're going to get, all get there together. We're leaving nobody behind. Everybody going to understand. All right? So the topic is wickedness in the EFA. E-P-H-A-H. EFA. We're going to get to the EFA soon. But we're going to talk about what's the wickedness in this EFA. As we try to understand the law that governs this new world order. So we're going to start with Zechariah 4. We're going to go through it together systematically. And we're going to let the Bible interpret itself. So let's, go at, let's go at it now. And the angel that talked with me, talked with me, came again and waked me as a man that is waked out of his sleep. So here Zechariah was clearly in prophetic vision, Yes? And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of gold with a bowl upon the top of it. So Zachariah is in vision. And he sees a candlestick, and on the top of the candlestick, he sees a what? A bowl. And is seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. 
and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So this is what Zachariah was seeing. Zachariah was seeing a bowl. Are you seeing that, friends? Yes. And he saw one olive tree on the right, or one olive tree on the right, depending on where you're looking from. One olive tree on the right, and one on the left. Olive tree on the right, olive tree on the left. And he saw a seven branch candle stand and a bowl. Are you following me so far? Yes. That's what he saw in vision. No. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Bear in mind, the discussion before was about this bowl, right? Yes. You can't stick with the bowl at the top. So he's asking the question, What does this mean? What does this bowl mean on this candlestick? Then the angel that walked, that talked with me, answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. So the context was a bowl. So what? Ever was in the context of the bowl represents the what? The Holy Spirit. So he saw this vision of a candlestick, several branch candlestick with a bowl on top, and he said, Now, what does this mean? Not by might, not by power, but by what? My spirit. So clearly, the oil from the olive trees going into the bowl represents the what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Let's go further now. Zechariah 4, verse 7 says, Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain? Oh, this is getting interesting now. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, which shout is crying, Grace, grace unto it. Now, here's why I sat down and I was making some adjustments. We have discussed mountain before in Bible prophecy, but many of you weren't here, so it's appropriate for me to put in those explanations. Yes. So what does a mountain represent in Bible prophecy? Well, Isaiah 2 verse 2 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. So in Bible prophecy, sometimes a mountain represents a church, sometimes it represents a what? A nation. So here's what I want us to appreciate. So mountain in Bible prophecy represents a nation in this context. So, I want you to catch a picture now. Who art thou, O great mountain? So, our question is asked. Yes. Who is this great mountain? And this great mountain is in opposition to Zerubbabel. Mm -hmm. Because before Zerubbabel, thou shalt be a what? A plain. So, here is Zerubbabel. Clearly, to do some building, you're going to understand that soon enough. And before he can do this boat building, what is in front of him? A great mountain, a great nation, in opposition to his building. Yes. And how you know is that he shall build it? Because he says it. And he shall bring forth a headstone. Headstone is what? The cornerstone. Nice. Are you following me? Yes. So here is Zerubbabel. So here, let's just start from the start again. So, Zachariah is in vision. He gets a picture of a, of a, of a candlestick, seven branch candlestick, with a bowl on top, and oil is being poured in the bowl from these two olive trees. And the Lord said, Zachariah, there are some building to be done, but it won't by might or power. Yeah. But by the what? Spirit. My spirit, my Holy Spirit. Yes. Zachariah, there is a what? Great mountain in contention with your building. Yes. But look at the promise. Thou shalt become a what? A plain. A plain. And he shall bring forth a headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace, grace unto it. Who's the headstone of the church? Christ. Jesus Christ. Now, let's go deeper now. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel hath laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. So, we see Zerubbabel come into picture right now. So here's a vision. One on olive tree, next olive tree, some brown candlestick, the bowl, the, the oil pouring represents and the Holy Spirit. And we hear Zerubbabel come into discussion. So who does Zerubbabel represent in prophetic application? Very simple to answer. 
Let's go to the lineage of the house of David. And let's see how we're going to understand who does Zerubbabel represent. So we start here in the book of Matthew. We talk about Solomon, then Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, all the Eias, Ezekiah, Ammon, Josiah, Joachim, Satya, Zerubbabel. Who? So the lineage of David is Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel is a type of Jesus, a type of Christ. Friends, are you following me? Yes. In the lineage of the house of David, David, and Jesus Christ is from the house of where? David. David yes. Is Zerubbabel. So he's a type of Christ. So, listen now. Zerubbabel had laid the foundation of the temple, and the Lord said his hands should finish it. It was important because it was a type of the Lord Jesus building the spiritual temple of the church. So let's go back now. I'm going to keep summarizing so he's still with me. Zachariah is in vision. He sees a candlestick with a bowl on top receiving all which represents the one. The Holy Spirit. He's told that there must be one. A building to be done. But there's a what? Great mountain, a nation. There's something in opposition. But it can become a plane. It will become a plane. And God is going to raise up his temple of who is going to be the builder. Zerubbabel was a type of what? Christ. Type of Christ. But God said he would not build it by his might or power, but by the spirit of the Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's why I said this morning I feel, I feel more relaxed now. Because the, the message preached to me before I came here. I was worried about the complex of the sermon and people are going to understand. It's not my worry. not my headache. Why? Because the house of God is going to be built by what? The Spirit of God. Alright? So let's have that pretty clear. Now let's go now. It's going to get me more deeper now. Let's go at it now. So Zerubbabel represents a type of Jesus Christ. Now, this is what I don't want you guys to miss. This is the crux of the study this morning, right here. Zechariah 4 verse 10. For who had despised the day of small things? So this Building going to start with a what? Small endeavor. Mm -hmm. And people are going to what? Despise it. Mm. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the earth. I want to focus on plummet. What's a plummet? What is a plummet or a plumb line? You know what a you know plumb line? Yes. What is a plummet or a plumb line? Representing a prophetic application. Hear what Amos 7 8 says. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line or a plummet. Then, then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb in the midst of my people. So I want, to, I want to get the point. Jesus Christ is rearing up a spiritual temple yeah. of which we are the one. Stones. Amen. And if using this plumb line to square every stone and set the building right. Amen. We're going to learn that the law of God is the plumb line, the standard of morality. Amen. Remember, we're studying what is the law for the new world order. I'm showing at the start here that God has set a standard. Understands the plumb line to see if every living stone, because we're living stone, we are lively stones. Yeah, if every living stone is square and upright, yeah, yes. and the plumb line he has set amongst his people yes. as a standard yes. of morality. Yeah, you can start to August 25th, 886, page, fifth paragraph says what? Look and see how, your, how stands your measurement of character. As compared with God's standard of righteousness, is what? Holy, Holy law. law. So that plumb line is God's what? Holy, Holy law. law. Which measures our character, and that is a standard of what? Morality. God's saying, God's doing. The worshippers are to pass under the measuring line of God. Who will bear, who will bear the test? Christ says, I know that works. Mm -hmm. You understand why I say that? Before we leave, you have to make a decision. Yes. 
Because before too long, we're going to be seeing the opposition. Right. But we'll have to make a decision right now, as early as now. Yeah. Are we going to silence God and be willing to do what? Squared by his plumb line, with his chiseling and refining? When you talk about the doctrine of Christians, troubles and trials, Christians don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear that. We want it nice and smooth. Yes. Oh, sanctification does require that, friends. Mm -hmm. Yes, friends. The carpenter and the mace of time have to be rubbing the stone yes. and put you against that plumb line. Is your morality measuring up yes. to God's standard? Is only love. So here we have a view vision again, friends. So let's go one more time. So here we see two holy trees, the seraphim can understand the bow with the Holy Spirit, represent the oil, represent the Holy Spirit. We see Zerubbabel, a type of Christ, with a plummet in his hand, the law of God. And these stones, he's, he's doing what? Squaring them. To be placed into what? His spiritual temple. His church. Zechariah 4, verse 11. Then answered I answered unto him, What are, what are these two olive trees? So his vision shifts down to the olive trees. And upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which chew the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? So we know already what oil represents, the Holy Spirit. He's asking now, what does the what? Olive. What does the olive tree represent? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So who are these two unanointed ones? Who, are, who is this? Let's look at it. 2 Peter 1, 10, 10, 21 says what? Yeah. Knowing this, that no prophecy of the one. Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by the men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. So the word of God is anointed. Amen. By what? The Holy Ghost. The scripture. So here we see what? The Old Testament, the New Testament represents the what? Amen. The Word of God represents the olive trees. Amen. But it's a beautiful imagery here. Yes. You never find the Word of God without the what? Amen. Spirit of God to give what? Amen. Light to the candlestick. Amen. So if somebody comes to you and says, Oh, I have good understanding. And they're not starting from the Word of God. Something is not right. And if they say, I've started the word of God, but I'm devoid of the spirit, mm -hmm. something is wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Spirit of God and the word of God are always in agreement. Yeah. They never disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it gets interesting now. So, explain Zechariah 4, we're going to go to Zechariah 5 now. So, Zechariah 5 starts by saying, verse 1, Then I turn and lift up my eyes and look behold a flying roll or a flying scroll. Are we nowadays with your book? Mm -hmm. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof ten cubits. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off. Praise the Lord. on this side, according to it. And everyone that swear it shall be cut off on that side. Praise the Lord! According to it. So we see a flying scroll. And it's cut into the left. I cut it to the right. Praise the Lord. But it cut in based on an issue of morality. Don't miss this now. Look at it. Everyone that steal it shall be cut off. On this side, according to it. And everyone on the that swear it. Clearly, Tom was fear to swear it in the fall sense, you know, clearly. Mm -hmm. Shall be cut off on the other side. So, let's go back. We see the law of God raised up as the standard of morality. Mm -hmm. Zachariah still in vision. And instead of the plumb line being discussed, the vision changed to no one. A flying one. Scrolled in one. Cut into the one. Right to the left. The law of God. It's like a sharp one, two edged one. Two edged sword that cuts away. To the right and to the left. Based on an issue of morality. Goes on, friends. I will bring it forth, say the Lord of hosts. 
and shall enter the house of the thief. Thank you, Jesus. We need something in the house of the thief. And into the house of him that straight falls by my name, and shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it, and the timber thereof, and the stones thereof. The word of God is powerful. Yes. So if you see, friends, swear falsely, the word of God shall find you out because it's the standard of morality. Amen. And this standard of morality is like a roll rolling through the earth. Zachariah's seventh vision was of a flying roll or scroll which undoubtedly was written God's righteous law and his penalty for sin. Paul called the penalty for sin, which is death, Romans 6, 23, the curse of the law in Galatians 3, 13. All who refuse the mercy of Christ and refuse to obey his righteous law must be paid the penalty of death. Yes. That's biblical. Let's deal with it, friends. Let's deal with it. So God has a standard of morality, which is his only one, law. And he's saying, my temple, my spiritual house will be built based on that standard. That's the standard that's going to be the plumb line to square you. Make up your mind if you want to be squared by God's law or not. There's no other way. And this standard is flowing through the earth. Cut into the left and cut into the right. Like a true two-edged sword. sword. The word of God, law of God. Get into the house of those who steal and those who swear falsely. Bring conviction for those who are accepting and those who refuse the penalty of death. It gets interesting now. Zechariah 5 verse 5 said, Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is that that void forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, It is an Eva that void forth. He said, Moreover, this is the semblance, resemb sem resemblance toward the other. So this is what an Eva is. Aifa is like a basket. What's an Aifa? Aifa is like a basket, a system to measure dry weight, dry measures. Follow me? Yes. Yeah. So in the old Hebrew system, there's two ways to measure. You could either measure liquid measures, the bar, the hin, and the log, different measurements for liquid. But for dry measures, it was the what? Hard, carbon, omer, seed, Aifa, omer. So that's the Aifa. It's a measurement of what? Dry weight. Are you following me now? You're following me, friends? Yeah. No. This is an EFA. <coughs> a system of measurement. That going forward, he said more about this is your resemblance to all what? Oh. So what we're seeing is this. We saw God's law as a standard of morality. But we're seeing a new what? Not a new system of what? Measurement. An IFA. Mm -hmm. An opposing standard to God's standard of morality. Mm -hmm. Are you following me, friends? Yes. The IFA was a system of measurement. Yes. And we saw that what? The plumb line law of God was a system of what? Measurement for righteousness. Yeah. We're seeing the opposing nation now, the opposing mountain coming into view now. Yes. It's because what's an IFA? So. It goes on. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is our a woman that sits in the midst of evil. Mm. This is fascinating. Yeah. Mm. So this new system, or this opposing system of measurement, is a woman within the ephah. Mm. So the woman sets a standard of what? An opposing standard of what? Morality. Yes. A woman sets an opposing standard of morality. So I sat there and I put in the question, what does a woman symbolize in Bible prophecy? 2 sure. Corinthians 11, 2 said, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you unto one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So therefore, a woman represents a church or a religious system in Bible prophecy. Yeah. So, we see God's flying scroll, his laws, as a standard of morality, but we are seeing a what? Opposing system of measurement of morality. A woman in the what? Ephah. A church is now establishing a what? New what? Standard. A church setting a new standard to measure morality. On my next slide, going forward, 
Wedding tents, they're going to go get into now. I really want you guys to really zoom in now. Here we go. Talk about natural law. Natural law is not the same thing as the laws of nature. Right. Right. Let's just get that out of the way. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about natural law. But let's ask some fundamental question. <coughs> what and where was the origin of this natural law? Let's start there. SR 18.2 Origin of natural law And you tell me what natural law is Based on what we're going to read now Satan grew bold in his rebellion And expressed his contempt of the creator's law okay. So when the rebellion started in heaven mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 12 talk about that I couldn't put that in here because it would have been too long a sermon There was a rebellion in heaven, yes? yes. And Lucifer was in contention with Jesus Christ and, the, and his angels. But here what was the issue of the contention. Satan grew bold in his rebellion and expressed his contempt of the creator's law. Mm -hmm. This Satan could not bear. He claimed that angels needed no law but should be left free, free to follow their own way which would ever guide them right. Wow. That is the origin of natural law. Natural law in its most fundamental state says that man of himself, no good of himself. So the flying rule is God's stand of morality, his commandments, his laws. Yes. And the woman in the ephah said, no, 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 no. You mankind, as Satan said, should be left free to follow your own will. So we see a contending you coming on here. That the law was a restriction on their liberty. I thought the Bible in James is the law of liberty. Uh -huh. Oh, I love that law. Yeah. Imagine if we all that kept that law we could walk any hours of night, any hours of the morning, free, free, free. Yes. It's a law of liberty. Yes. For those who keep the law. Mm -hmm. And that to abolish law was one great object of his standing as he did. Mm -hmm. So the first mention of natural law was from the very mouth of Lucifer. Yes. Who says what? Angels and men must be free mm. to follow their own will. Mm. The condition of the angels, he thought, needed improvement. Not so the mind of God who had made laws and exalted them equal to himself. The happiness of the angelic host consisted in their perfect obedience to law. Each had his special work assigned him. And until Satan rebelled, there had been perfect order and harmonious action in heaven. So obedience to God's law was, in, was what? We brought what? Perfect harmony and peace. Now, this system of natural law, friends, zoom in right now, friends, don't miss it now. This system of natural law was borrowed and codified in the Roman Catholic Church system. It started first with Aristotle. We're talking 384 to 322 BC. Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, he devised what he called the final cause or purpose of humanity. So, no, no, what is what his views was? Whatever your purpose in, you, in humanity was, that's what he was carry out. Anything that prevents or interferes with the purpose for which something is created is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting concept, you know. So this was the embryonic stage now the codification of this system of natural law that the devil said angels and men are free and must be free to follow their own will. But the person who really put things in terms of a document was Thomas Aquinas. Mm. And this, friends, take a picture of this slide. Because this slide is what is ruling the world now and the world to come before Jesus Christ comes. This one slide yeah. summarized the entire system of the New World Order. This one, this one simple slide right here. Here's an interesting bit with this slide. Law, what's natural law? An ordinance of reason. Whose reason? Man's reason. Ordinance of reason. For the common good. You must come back this evening because we're going to spend the whole hour this evening and talk about just the common good. Those of you who are attached to your cars and your house, mm -hmm. oh, 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 you shall lose it. Oh, yeah. 
So come back this evening and understand why you're going to lose it. You must lose it. You're going to lose it. Yeah. Come back this evening and discuss common good. But for now, let's focus on natural law. An ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community. Wow, that's a bummer. So the law is established by him who has what? Who has care for the community. Friends, I wonder if you guys get getting what this is really saying. Yeah. This is talking about what's going to be an international law yeah. where he was in charge internationally will make the what? The law. Yeah. And the law is intended for what? Common good. But we have to understand what common good means. Mm. You have to come back and understand what common good means. So this was Aquinas. He's going to codify the whole system of natural law. He goes on by saying, Aquinas built on the ideas of Aristotle and developed natural law into a moral framework. It's an absolute theory of ethics and is not rooted in duty or externally imposed laws. This is fascinating. I must do not know. So natural law is an absolute theory mm. of ethics. It is not rooted in duty or externally imposed laws. So it bears no resemblance to the Ten Commandments and God's laws. Because it says it here. It is not rooted in what? Duty or external imposed laws. So natural law is not rooted in the Ten Commandments. Because it's an external law. Right. Are you going to be clear on that, friends? Yes. yes. Friends, are we clear on that point? Yes. yes. Because people are going to run and say all kinds of stuff. You have to understand what these words mean. Natural law has no divine origin. Right. It's external. It has no external. We have no relation to external law. Instead, it's found upon human nature and our search for genuine happiness and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. what, what, what did they ever say? The angels and men must be left to what? To their own what? Free will and their own what? Choice. To establish their standard of morality. There's a natural order in the world determined by some supernatural power that should be followed. Some supernatural power. I wonder who that is. Mm -hmm. In their dispensation, mm -hmm. human beings are naturally inclined towards its moral code. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we're all falling right. and we're all going down. Right. So, this supernatural person here can't be Jesus Christ and God and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, it must be some other supernatural being yeah, exactly. who lead people into what? Rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. Because it says it's naturally inclined towards that moral code. The moral life is life lived according to what? Reason. By discovering our end tears of purpose, we can work out how to achieve this. It does not give a fixed law. It is not always straightforward. And there is some flexibility in this application. So are we going to be surprised that we find this natural law is going to change as time goes on? In terms of it's how it's expressed but not in its substance? Is that, would that be surprising? No. no, because it says so. It says that. There's some flexibility to it, right? Right. <laughs> the Roman power of the papers is setting a new standard to measure morality that is called natural law. And the Bible said, and he said, this is what? Wickedness. Wickedness. So that's why the topic today is wickedness in the ether. So the opposing standard to God's flying road or system of morality, the Ten Commandments is laws, is a system of what? Wickedness. By a woman setting the standard of measurement in the ephah. Natural law. Now, you're getting interesting now. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So let me put this in context. So while... Zachariah in vision. The Lord showed Zachariah that the lead lid on the ether was lifted up mm -hmm. and a woman was seen. Mm -hmm. So at some time, the lid was open. Okay. And what was seen was a woman. A woman inside. It. So at some time, there was a point in time where this system of natural law was what? Brought forth and what? Exposed to the world. Yes. Are you following me, friends? Okay. So let's go back in time now and find out when was it that this system of natural law 
represented by the woman in the ephah was exposed by the what? Lead lid being what? Lifted up. So let's peep now inside the lead lid as lifted up. Let's go back in time. So lift up the talent of lead. We're going to Revelation 11, 3, 4, 7, and 8. Revelation 11, 3, 4 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two. What did you experience with olive trees before? Yes. Yes. So you see what the Lord using the imagery in the Old Testament in the what? New Testament. So are we in the right context? Oh, yes. Because yes, we're talking about the same concept of olive trees. And goes on by saying, and the two candlesticks standing before the what? So the two witnesses are the two olive trees are, which are the same as the two candlesticks. So we learned before that the two olive trees was the what? Old and the New Testament. The word of God says, Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So the word of God is still what? The old and the New Testament. So the two witnesses are the what? Old and the New Testament. And the Bible says they're going to be witnessing for all long. 1,203 score days. Now for those who are not familiar with Bible prophecy, a day represents a year. So 1 to the 260 days represents 1 to the 260 years. And afterwards I'll show it to you. I'll give you some scriptural reference for that. Follow me carefully now. So the two witnesses, the two witnesses, the Old and New Testament, is going to prophesy for a period of 1 to the 260 years, but clothed in what? Sackcloth. So it's going to be what? Oppressed and persecuted in its what? Witness. And this we describe as the Dark Ages, from 530 AD to 1798. If you subtract these two, it takes you know, 1 to 260 years of papal supremacy. And there are certain other references in the Bible that supports that. By the way, when we finish, I'm going to give the, the lecture to Sister Keisha, and she's going to set out to everybody. So give Sister Keisha your, your email address, and you're going to get a full lecture. All right? So I really want you guys to zoom in and listen. That's really one listening to go on right now. Understanding the principle. That's what I want you right now. So, the two witnesses, the Old and New Testament, the olive, which is the same as the olive trees and the two candlesticks, the Word of God, the Old and New Testament, going to prophesy for 1 to, the 200, 1 to the 260 years in hiding under persecution in sackcloth. And this represents the period from 538 to 1798 when the papacy was having supremacy. And the Waldenses and the people of the Piedmont Valley. Yeah. They are the people prophesying what? Sackcloth. In hiding. Persecution. No. It gets interesting now. Revelation 11, 7 says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the testimony was finished sometime about 1798, so around that time, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So follow me now, friends. The lead, lead was what? Lead. Lifted up. Yes. Revelation 11, 7 said, A beast has sent out of the what? Okay. Bottomless pit. So whatever came out of that bottomless pit represented what was in the what? The ephah. So we're going to say, what is this beast that's going to come out now? I'm going to peep in the ephah. I'm going to see something coming out. So let's first answer the question. What's a beast in Bible prophecy? And you realize what I keep on doing? I keep letting the Bible explain itself. Yes. I'm not giving you my interpretation. You realize I'm inconsistent. Yeah. All right, let's continue. continue. So what's a beast in Bible prophecy? Daniel 7, 20, 20, 24 says what? Then he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth. Kingdom. So what's a beast in Bible prophecy? Kingdom. A kingdom. So see, it's not difficult. We don't stick with the Bible and the Bible explain itself. Yeah. So, a beast in Bible prophecy is a kingdom or a state or a government or a ruling power. So the beast now coming out of the bottomless pit is a, a nation yes, sir. rising up. But the Bible don't leave us to guess what's the characteristic of the nation. It explains it. It goes on by saying what? And their dead bodies shall lie in the street. That's the whole New Testament was discarded. Which spiritually is called, spiritually not literally. See that friends? Spiritually, you see that? Spiritually is called what? Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jesus Christ didn't die in, in Sodom or Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it must talk about God's who? People. So we're seeing here, a lead lid was lifted up, and I was seeing, yes, 
a bees ascending, same context now, out of the bottom of this pit, and it's a system that is characterized by Solomon Egypt. Now what's so peculiar about Solomon Egypt? Exodus 5 2 says, And Pharaoh said, Pharaoh was what? The king of what? Egypt. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord that I will let Israel go. So Pharaoh had the spirit of what? Atheism. Atheism is, is, is what? Denial of who? Of God. Are you following me, friends? Yes. So we're seeing here a nation rising, and the characteristic of the nation is one of what? Atheism. Let's get some. Let's so it goes on. So it's here the beast characteristics of atheism as in Egypt. Now, this specification of the prophecy was also fulfilled by what? Right. France. In no land had the spirit of enmity against Christ been more strikingly displayed. In no country had the truth encountered more, more bitter and cruel opposition. In the persecution on which France had visited upon the confessor of the gospel, she had crucified Christ in the person of his yeah. disciples. So, we're describing here a new system of morality characterized by a woman in an ephah, and at some point in time, the lead lid was lifted up and what was seen was his system of wickedness. I was seeing the parallel in Revelation chapter 11 with the same discussion about the two olive trees, but we see a beast rising now. An atheistic beast that we describe to have in France. But France at what time? The beast is atheistic France at the time of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Just around the time of 1798. You see that, friends? 1789-1815. So, we're going to spend some time and discuss the French Revolution. Friends, I want you, I want you guys to wake up now, you know. Because what I'm going to discuss now will be what is going to come again. Mm -hmm. Alright? So that lead leak was lifted up. And we're going to see what was the wickedness in that lead leak. Mm -hmm. That, what have you seen that lead leak in that, in that ether? Yep. That wickedness? That's going to be the opposing standard of morality. Mm -hmm. So we're in a very interesting world to come. Let's hold on very tight as I delve into this. So we want to start by discussing the French Revolution. We're going to discuss that interesting way. We want to start before with the philosophy that preceded the French Revolution. Are you following me, friends? Yeah. What was the philosophy that preceded the French Revolution? And there's one person I've discussed is Voltaire. Now tell me what was Voltaire's mindset. You must tell me now. Let's get into it. Perhaps the most influential of all Enlightenment philosophers. 1694 to 1778. So he died basically some nine, ten years before the French Revolution. But his fiscal philosophy was preceded the French Revolution. Are you following me? Yes. Yeah. He wrote his criticisms with a sharp sarcasm that ridiculed those whom he disagreed with. He challenged traditional Catholic theology. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it seems. Yeah. <laughs> Strong deist views. Believe prayer and miracles did not fit with, not, with, with what? Natural. With what, friends? Natural. Natural law. So what was the philosophy that preceded the French Revolution? Natural, Natural law. Yeah. Believe that human reason was a key to progress in society, not religious faith. Mm -hmm. He believed that what? Human what? Reason. reason. So you think he's some friend with Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas? I think they are pretty, I will lose it for himself. Mm -hmm. I think they are saying they speak in the same language. Yeah. His social criticism inspired a call for change, setting the, setting the stage for the French Revolution. Are you seeing friends? Yes. Ideology. Friends, why are you guys listening to friends? I'm laboring on this point. So whenever this ideology comes back again, what is going to follow? Mm -hmm. The sins of the French Revolution. Yes. You guys didn't get that. That's yes. why you guys just skip. No, let me go back onto that. Okay. If you hear this ideology being repeated, what is going to follow will be the scenes of the French Revolution. Yes. You understand what I'm trying to get the point of why I'm laboring this point? Yes. I don't want to submit that, friends. So the system of natural law, when it's elevated, the end result is going to be bloodshed. Yes. Let us see if that was the case of the French Revolution. So let's look. He had created bigotry and injustice and called religious intoleration. So he, so he says, 
His most famous quote to against religious intolerance was crush the infamous thing. That was the Bible, by the way. Crush the Bible. That's what his view was. Although Voltaire was raised a Christian, he came to distrust organized religion as corrupted in leadership and from having moved away from the central message of Jesus. That's a, that's a sparse. Advocated enlightened despotism, believing that people were incapable of governing. People were incapable of governing themselves. You guys didn't get that? Yeah. What did Aquinas say? Natural law is a system of ordinance established by you who what? Rules the what? Community. Yeah, right. I think these, are, these guys are bedfellows. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think so. They seem as if they like, they like each other's concept. Yes. It goes on. He views influence several inline despots, including and discuss a whole host of despots that came from this natural law philosophy. So this was the philosophy imbuing France before the French Revolution. And this caused the society to look like this in France. Now you must tell me the society look like this now. The first estate, it concerned the Roman Catholic clergy. They were the highest. Then the second estate was it considered the nobles, about 2% of the population who and own 20% of the land. Oh, yeah. You know, I always find it fascinating oh, when you hear the Protestants talk yeah, about 2%. Yes. 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 You know, and they talk about the, 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 you know, the tax break benefit only 2%. Whoa, yeah. oh, I've heard that. Yeah. Oh, that's why every time I ask all this money, I say, whoa. Yeah. Only, only this is the French, the French system being structured again. Yes. 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 Exactly what's happening in France. Yes. Ah. Yes. The third estate. They had little rights and paid off of their income taxes. The bourgeois, wealthy merchants and, and skilled workers, the city workers, poorly paid servants like cooks and attendants, and the peasants, 80% of the population were farmers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So then, friends, the philosophy of the French Revolution in line the age of reason, friends. Scientists, university pronouncers have discovered laws that govern natural world. So they say, philosophy was what? Began to ask if natural laws might also apply to human beings. Mm -hmm. See, natural law principle, friends, friends yes. it established a secular thinking. They use reason and logic rather than faith, religion, and they didn't believe in any divine power. Use reason and logic to determine how governments are formed. And they question the right rights of kings, even the king of glory. Mm -hmm. so this was the mindset at the time. So when the lead link was lifted up, and the French Revolution was about to start, this is what was coming up, out, coming up. A system of natural law. Voltaire, Thomas Aquinas philosophy, Aristotle philosophy, Luciferian philosophy of natural law. And it set the stage for the French Revolution. And this, another person whose name must be mentioned when you discuss the French Revolution. Maximilian Robespierre. It is an aristocratic the idea of a great being that watches over oppressed innocence and punishes triumphant crime is altogether popular. Mm -hmm. What you were saying? The masses believe in this issue about there's some God. Mm -hmm. No, that's rubbish. They truly be aristocratic in it, go on. Aetis, that's what you were saying. Yeah. You were saying the plebs, the plebeian group, the lower group, they believe in this thing about God up here taking care of you. No, let's, let's put it aside. If you truly want to be aristocratic, you must be what? An 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 so that was the atheistic spirit that came when Pharaoh said what? I know not God. Oh, yes. And embodied in the French Revolution. It was a system that pushed atheism. Put away the commandments of God. Men can what? Rule themselves. Luciferian language. And friends, they established this code of ethics that was based on natural law. The National Assembly wrote their revolutionary ideas, ideas in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens, which said, men are born free and equal in rights. Let me ask a question. Who control, who determines the freedom and the rights? He who what? Controls the what? Community. I don't want you guys to forget that, you know. I don't want you guys to forget that piece. Because that was the essence of what Thomas Aquinas said. The issue of natural law is the rights are determined by who you what? Controls the community. Rights include liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. You have to come back for this season, friends. We will discuss common good. It guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and equal of justice. 
But who is the person controlling the community? Mm -hmm. He determined what's what? What's free? What's free? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So, dear friends, I'm making a point here. God help me. Please give me wisdom to explain these concepts. You might hear these concepts superficially and you say, ah, oh, this sounds good. Mm -hmm. But you have to go deeper, friends. Yes. Yes, and the deepness I take, it yes. take it to the point where the pits of hell says what? Man can determine man's own destiny. 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 Mm. That's the essence of it, friends. But is a man over what? A man. Mm -hmm. Here you go. So let's press on. So humanism, yeah. so this system of atheism also is nicely tied to what? Humanism. Yeah. Putting human beings and other living things at the center of moral outlook. Friends, you hear that? Yeah. I thought that Jesus Christ and his commandments were the center of our moral outlook. No, no, not human, not humanism manifesto, not their mindset. You what I said, friends? Human beings and living things are the center of moral outlook. Seeing the world as a natural place and looking to science and reason to make sense of it. So, no longer look into the flying scroll, the laws of God, mm -hmm. but look into the Eva. Where, 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 who's in Eva? The woman. The Roman Catholic Church system and the natural law system is a new system, com competing system of morality. That's what natural law and humanism says. Promoting and supporting human flourishing across all frontiers and championing human rights for everyone. So, we'll get back to that. And they are the humanism. Humanism. Man is a measure of all things. Protagoras, 5th century BC. This was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. He was a humanist. So man is a measure of all things. But I thought we learned that Zerubbabel had that plumb line. And the flying rose a measure. The standard. But we see that competing view now, a competing world view, this new world order view, saying that what? Man is a measure of all things. We've seen a competition going on here. Yes. Radical leaders of the National Convention feared that the enemies of the re of revolution would try to overthrow the new republic. Listen, our friend. In 1793, radical Maximilian Robespierre slowly gained control of the National Convention. From 1793 to 1794, Robespierre executed 40,000 traitors during an even known as the Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror ended when French citizens turned on Robespierre. This is going to play back to the very T. So when, friends, the system of the New World Order fully establishes this law of natural order, it has been established now, I'm going to show you. When it's elevated, the result is going to be bloodshed like you have never seen. That's what was seen when the lead lid was lifted up. And the response was what? This is wickedness. Mm -hmm. Roman power people set in a new standard to measure the morality called natural law. He cast, this is wickedness, and he cast it into the midst of the ephod, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. So God in his mercy said, Zachariah, have a look. Mm -hmm. And he saw the scenes of the French Revolution where there was atheistic madness. 40,000 people being killed in less than a year. Mm. And God in his mercy did what? Hold it back. So the French Revolution was ended in 1885. That's when it becomes no our problem. Let's hold on now. Guys, it's going to get right to our time. So the lead lit was lifted up. And they saw the end results of natural law, which ends up in what? Wickedness, Wickedness and murder and bloodshed. Mm. Atheistic mindset that says man can rule man oneself. Man is the measure of all things. But God is mercy. Covered it up. We just finished there. Goes on by saying, Zachariah 5 9. There were two women coming from the wind in the there were two women. Coming with the wind in their wings, for they are the wings like the wings of a stork, right. and they lifted up the basket or the ephah between earth and heaven. Mm. So, after this system of confusion and bloodshed and war, the winds, winds of strife, mm. what was seen was what? A depiction, so Zachary's vision still. He sees two women with wings like the wings of a what? 
store and they had the ephah with the lead lid covered up and they lit it up between what? Earth and heaven. heaven. Are you seeing that? Yes. So lifting up the ephah between heaven and earth. We're going to spend some time on that one. Lift on the ephah between heaven and earth. So, who is inside the ephah? We know already, right? The Roman power, the papers, the natural law as humanism, right? Yes. That's what's in the ether that's been lifted up by two women with wings like star. Now, who are these two women carrying the ether? We learned before that a woman represents a church or a religious system by the prophecy, yes? yes? Second Corinthians 11, 2. We discussed that before, remember? Yes. Now, here's what's interesting. You must tell me what kind of woman this is now. Listen, or what kind of church is it? And there were two women coming with the wind in their wings. So they were driven by a system of strife. The winds of strife in their wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. A stork is an unclean bird. So when the Spirit of God is being described in the Bible, it's described as a what? Dove. Yes. You follow me, friends? Yes. A dove is a clean bird. Yes. But this spirit that inhabits these women are the spirits of a stork, an unclean bird. So these women, this church is now what? A corrupt or unclean church. Yes. Friends, are you following me? Yes. So, two corrupt churches now lift up the system of natural law of humanism and carry what now? Heaven war between heaven and earth. Whoa. Friends, are you following me? Yes. Let me go one more time. I don't want to lose anybody now. I don't want to lose anybody now. Follow me carefully now. So the lead lid was what? Covered up, French Revolution ending. But two women like what? Storks with what? The wind in their wings. So they are, they are being driven by a system of what? Strife. Lifting up one now. The lead, the what? The ephah. And who is the ephah? The church. The humanism. Uh, natural law. The papacy, Roman Catholic Church system. But the woman in Bible prophecy represents a what? A church. church or religious system. Mm -hmm. But these are not dove-like no. women. No. These are stork-like women. Yeah. A stork is a what? Mm -hmm. Unclean bird. So the spirit that inhabits these two churches are what? The spirit of what? Unclean. Uncleanness, corruption. corruption. System of corruption. Yes. Elevating the system of natural law, which is the competing system against God's what? Flying road and, and what the plumb line in Zerubbabel Zan goes on, friends. So, who are these two corrupt churches carrying the ephah? Mm -hmm. The great controversy 588 yeah. 1911 says, What the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf, grasp the hand of spiritualism, they will reach over the abyss to class hands with the power of Roman power. And under the influence of these three four years, the country will follow in the steps of women trampling the rights of. Conscience. Mm -hmm. So, what are we saying here, friends? Spiritualism yes. and apostate Protestantism yes. shall lift up and indeed right now are lifting up yes. the system of natural and humanism yes. and carrying it everywhere between yes. them and yes. Yes. Let's see what's been done. Spiritualism. Natural laws of spiritualism. I found this was a fascinating study. Friends, I beg, I beg of you guys or something. No, it's just time to study the Bible. Yes. Law is doing something. I, I, I've been studying the Bible for almost 20 years. And I'm at the, the Lord has brought us to a point where he's eager to give light now. Yes. Stuff I've been studying for years, I couldn't understand. The Lord, even this morning, the Lord said, get up, go and read again. I have more light to give you. Please, friends. Take these sermons and study them. Please, I beg you. Confirm yourself in your own study, my sister. Please. Don't just take my word for it. So we're going to ask the question. Spiritualism and apostate Protestantism or evangelicalism. How are they holding on to this ether which has humanism in there and natural laws in there? How is it being done? Here it is. I actually found a very interesting quotation. Natural laws of spiritualism. In accordance with the tenets of... In accordance with the what? Tenets. Right? So that means in accordance with what? The, the traditions, the beliefs, the patterns, yeah. the understanding. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Of spiritualism. 
Infinite intelligence is love, light, and law. Mm -hmm. I was message at the French Revolution now. Yes. Same concepts. Mm -hmm. There is no set number of natural laws. Mm. What a flexibility we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Right? As the community continues to expand and evolve with current knowledge, and they believe natural laws are as unlimited as infinite intelligence itself. Mm -hmm. So there are a of natural law above who? God himself. Yes. So does, does spiritualism imbibe natural law? Yes. yes. yes here, 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 here's another one. What is spiritualism? A religion based on the ability. This is spiritual humanism. Don't miss this now, friends. Don't miss this now. Spiritualism. How is it spiritualism that is holding on to humanism? Or natural law? To spiritual humanism. Did I lose you guys? No. Let me go one back. I don't want to lose anybody. Let's go one more time. Spiritualism takes all of natural law as humanism. How? Through the concept and the philosophy of spiritual humanism. So what is spiritual humanism? That's a link between spiritism and what? Humanism. Listen to now, friends. And that is this coming from what is humanism? Alright? And this is coming from, um, from this, this spiritualism church. We went to their web website. A religion based on the ability of human beings to solve the problems of society using logic and science. Mm. Hey, we don't want God in this. We don't want God in this. Lucifer and language. Yes. Most people need a religion to help guide them through life's challenges and difficult moral decisions. Recognizing how the power of religious rituals, methods, and communication can impact humans' behavior, spiritual humanism fuses, fuses traditional religious behaviors onto the foundation of scientific humanist inquiry. Brilliant move by them. The devil says, guess what? They're not going to swallow humanism like that. If you are spiritual, let's, let's mix with some humanism. Let's blend them. Let's fuse them. So the fusion of spiritualism, when it holds on to natural law, humanism is called what? Spiritual what? Humanism. What about evangelicals? Mm. Or the apostate Protestantism? Yeah. Yeah. Let's discuss them now. Yeah. Because they were the other, they were the other, other woman, other bird, stalk yeah. like bird. Yeah. Evangelicals make up a significant segment of the American population and have a long history of political activity. At the same time, evangelicals are not famous for offering a current framework of thought for their involvement in the political sphere. Listen up, friends. Several Roman Catholic and Protestant scholars have suggested that evangelicals would do well to appropriate the natural law, law traditions. Evangelicals, political thought, scriptural, natural law. Yes. Mm. So the push is saying, Protestantism. If, by the way, don't call them Protestantism anymore. They're like evangelicals. Yeah. Because they're not protesting. And they, they, they're very offended when you call them yeah. Protestants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. no more Protestants. You can't call them that. Call them evangelicals. Exactly. That's a nice couple term. Mm -hmm. So they're saying, Roman Catholics and Protestant scholars are saying, hey, why don't you get, take, hold on to this natural law tradition? Mm -hmm. So you know you have what? Christian humanism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Christian humanism. Listen what Christian humanism says. Christian humanism is not new. It has been around since the late Middle Ages in one form or another. But was most notable that movement in Catholicism in the Renaissance and through the Enlightenment. You know, friends? So from the early days of the French Revolution, you saw the fomentation of Christian humanism. It has become an insistent but minor theme among the variants of Christian belief that have emerged in the last half of the 20th century. From liberation theology to the emergence of fundamentalism, liberalism, and gospel, social gospel. Come back this evening, friends, we're discussing the social gospel. The view that we describe expound years of Christianity that has dispensed with the mythical framework in which Christianity has been passed down to us and is therefore a non theistic religion. Wow, you guys hear that? No, no, God. Non theistic religion, religion unless Christianity that. Christianity with God. God. Yes. So friends, Christian humanism states there is Christianity with God. Mm. But guess what? They like Christ because they say it's, it's what? His social teachings were good. Mm. But let's put the Father aside. Mm. That emphasizes the humanity of Jesus and is guided by a belief in human freedom 
individual conscience and rational inquiry. Christianity without? So friends, these two stark like women churches. Spiritualism holds on to natural law through spiritual humanism. Christianity, or in this case, apostate Protestantism, or evangelicals, the other stark like birth, holding on to what? Natural law and humanism with what? Christian humanism. A fusion. And this is being elevated now, friends. Now, hear what it is. This way to come. I'm going to sum about 10 or 20 more slides. Next 10 minutes, we're finished. Stay with me. Zachariah 5, 10, 11 now. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, Where are they taking Ephah? Where are they taking Ephah? Then he said to me, To build a temple for her in the land of Shinar, and when it is prepared, she shall be set there on her own pedestal. So here's the image of friends. The imagery is this. This is Jerusalem, where it's a Zechariah division. Here is China, which is Babylon. Follow me, friends. And the imagery is that this ephah is being taken up by these two stalk like birds, these two churches, spiritualism and apostate Protestantism or evangelicalism. Is elevating now, follow me, friends, this system of natural law, which is based on spiritual humanism and Christian humanism, all a part and parcel of atheism, all a part and parcel of natural law. It's been elevated. That's the imagery. Are you following the imagery now? Yeah. Well, let's apply the imagery now. Prophetic application. From a global perspective, friends, this Roman power papacy, much manifest as natural law, not secular humanism, humanism is taking, not secular humanism, that's a typo, supposed to say humanism, is taking the natural law and placed on a global foundation in China or Babylon, the whole world. The whole world. So how is it going to be established in the whole world? There must be a system. Natural law is a moral foundation for the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. You guys got that? Natural law is the foundation principle of the Declaration of the Human Rights that was established in 1948 going to place it on our pedestal of foundation. Set it strong. You got it, my brother. You got it. The inherent dignity and the equal, equal and indelible rights of all members of the human family is a foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. That sounds exactly like the French Revolution, yes? The third artists include, all humans are born free and equal in dignity and right, as established by he who controls the community. Don't forget that, friends. You see, they're not, they're not only say that to you, but you have to understand that's, it, yeah, that's it, the, the philosophy behind it. Freedom and rights without distinction, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political opinion, property, status. Ooh, come back this evening, friends. Oh, those house and cars are going to go. I'm trying my best to get poor, friends. I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. I want you guys to join me because they're going to come and take it. Come back this evening. We're going to discuss common law. Come on, good. Come on, good this evening. No one shall be subject to torture, cruel, oh, unless you are an enemy combatant. Yes. Mm, right. So everything beneath your friends have what? An exception to it. Yes. Don't get the gullible and get caught up in the, with this human rights, friends. friends. I'm going to explain human rights to you soon enough. I'm just trying to show you some of the, the, the little nuances in the understanding that you have to appreciate. Everyone has a right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, includes freedom to change religion or belief. Children and our belief. Why well, is there going to be some coercion involved in that? Mm. Mm. Everyone has a right to freedom of peaceful assembly. Mm. I wonder for how long. <laughs> so here it is, friends. If you doubt that the Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations is coming from humanism, look that on symbol. the symbols there. It's the yeah. exact symbol. Yeah. Libri, Vox, same thing. Same thing, friends. Man is the measure of all. That's humanism. United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. That is their symbol. The humanist man. Same exact system. So human rights are established on the principles of natural law. Do we understand that, friends? 
Human rights are not established on the principles of God's Ten Commandments. Right. Church, please wake up. Amen. Let me say that one more time. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is not established on the Word of God. Because the system says it does not subscribe to any external system of what? Law. So the human rights based on the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is based on natural law, which says man can determine right from wrong by himself. But bear in mind, he's guided by what? The person in charge of the community. Absolutely. So here it is, friends. Here it is, friends. 2008, April 19, Pope Pounds Human Rights and United Nations denounce it go it alone superpower strategies for global problems. Pope Benedict XVI yesterday upheld the United Nations as a crucial defender of human rights and a force of peace while warning that unless those human rights are considered God-given. One of which God is talking. Mm. <laughs> they will be subject to what you want to do. Subject to what? I want to bridge. You guys are listening carefully now. Fred, let me explain something. They just made a point quite clear. Human rights are subject to what? Erosion or what? Revocation. Let's go on. In one of the most anticipated stops at the US tour, Paul Bendy told the UN General Assembly that the, human, that the rights encoded in the United Nations 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I remind you, was based on what? Natural law, he's saying that now, apply to everyone by virtue of the common origin of person who remains the high point of God's creative design for the world and for history. For every person. Mm -hmm. So he who leads the community says what? Natural law applies to what? Everybody. 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 Yes, sir. I just want us to be clear. So God's flying role with the two edges, that's called the left and right. That goes deep in. And say, if you are teeth, you are convicted. Stop teething. <laughs> if you are lying, stop lying. There's grace. Grace. Yeah. That's what they call us. Right. Grace, grace. Remember we learned that in Zachariah yeah. 4? Yes. No, no, not the system. The system is the ephah. The woman in that ephah. This is wickedness. A system that breeds corruption. And two talk like birds. Two churches. Spiritualism and apostate protestantism or evangelicalism as they call it to spiritual humanism and to christian humanism elevate this system of natural law yes. and we're going to place on the land of china a worldwide system because china is no worldwide yes. i'm saying hey this is on the pedestal now we have laid the foundation and he's here echoing Everybody. Ooh, One that control the community say what? Everybody's dog governed by what? Yeah. Apply to everyone by virtue of the common origin of person. So friends, here's my commentary now. I want you guys to understand the distinction between natural law, between natural law, human rights, and God given rights. Listen, friends. I'm gonna make a distinction between human rights and God given rights. Man has God given inalienable rights as seen in the Ten Commandments. Amen. Rights that cannot be bought, sold, suspended, or revoked. So the rights that we find in God's law can't be taken away, can't be revoked, we can't even sell them. They are inalienable. That's God given rights. The concept of reason will once again be elevated as a true means to obtain happiness and enlightenment, as was elucidated during the French Revolution. This is manifested in a man-based morality as expressed in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. On the surface, man-made human rights may seem agreeable. However, if these rights are given by man, they can be taken by that's the trick and the essence of human rights. Yeah. It's a man-given right. Mm -hmm. 
And you heard the Pope says what? Be revoked or changed. Friends, we got that. Friends, I don't want any human rights. Because I've been given God given rights already. Because if man give me human rights, what man can do? Man can take them back because he who controls what? Community. It's based on natural law, friends. Human rights are not God given rights. They are man given rights. And as Aquinas said, what is natural law? It's a law of ordinance that's based on reason and common good. Established by he who controls the community. So if you control the community and says, guess what? I'm going to take it away, I'll take it away. Mm -hmm. You got to come back this evening to hear about the common good. And those rights that you think you have, and you think you're holding on to those many houses and cars, <laughs> they shall go flying. <laughs> Listen, friends. On the surface, man-made human rights may seem agreeable. However, if these rights are given by man, they can be taken by man. Yes. Unlike the rights delineated in the Ten Commandments, which are given by God and therefore will never be taken by God, only forfeited by each individual or subverted by another individual. Mm -hmm. Friends, you get a distinction? So, friends, here's my wrapping up slides. So, here's a summary slide. In contrast to God's flowing scroll and Zerubbabel, the type of Christ for the plumb line, the laws of God and the commandments of God, the standard of morality to square each stone to be in that temple, spiritual temple. That this opposing great mountain, this nation is opposing, that God's going to make a what? Plain. And lay the headstone, Jesus Christ, I'm going to shout what? Grace, grace, grace! There's an opposition. A woman in the ephah who sets a new standard of morality, a competing standard of morality. And when it was lifted up, wickedness, the breath of the wasp of the dragon's breath came out. The French Revolution, murder and bloodshed. God in his mercy says what? Wickedness, cover it down. We saw two women, two stark like women, two churches, spiritualism, apostate protestantism. Through spiritual humanism, Christian humanism, elevating this system worldwide and set it on the temple that is in the United Nations. Sure foundation. And this is what's taking the world captive, this system of human rights, which find its birth from the corrupted womb of the papacy, natural law, and Lucifer himself when he said. Angels don't need no laws to govern them. By their own reason, they can make right and wrong. Friends, there are two competing laws to define morality. You make up your mind right now. I'm not going to leave you until you make up your mind. You must make up your mind right now. Whose law are you going to decide to follow? God's Ten Commandments or Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is based on natural law? You got to make up your mind. Now, here in our friends, here's my second and last slide. Natural law mediates. This is a fascinating statement by this, this Roman Catholic monk, Holton Dush. This is what he says Natural law mediates moral law. Mediate. You guys don't get that? So, natural law is above God's word. Ten Commandments. And the natural law is what? Bring interpretation to God's word. Ten Commandments. That's what he's saying. Natural law mediates moral law and is found within creation. It can be discerned through the use of reason. It seeks the what? Come on, good sounds good, but come on this evening and you understand what common good really means. So, friends, this is my last slide. I invite you to come back this evening for common good. This evening, we want to spend the time. We have to spend all this time laboring to understand natural law as a competition to God's Ten Commandments. But how is that natural law going to manifest itself in our time? What will it look like? What will the application? What is it going to affect you and your house and your land and your wife and your children and your property? And your religion? And your politics? So this evening we're going to spend time and look at the social and political nature of the new world order. We saw the law and from every law must come some application, yes? So we're going to look at application this evening. The social and political aspects of this natural law, this new world order philosophy. How is it going to affect your social life? How is it going to affect the politics of this country? 
Is it affecting the policy of this country already? Yeah. What's going to affect the policies of the entire world? What role does the United Nations have to play in the social and political spheres of the world that we live in? As natural law is elevated and given a sure foundation in the land of China. I invite you to come back this evening at 6 o'clock as we discuss common good. Shall we close up?